Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our panel on the Rights of Nature movement. And if you are new to Bioneers, uh, one thing to understand is that the Rights of Bioneers has supported and been a champion of teaching people about the Rights of Nature movement for well over 10 years right now. And today we have three panelists. They're all attorneys. Don't be scared. They're <laughs> not working for the dark side. We're going to talk about what is rights of nature, what's happening with the movement, where do we think the movement is going, and how can people get involved with that. So I am Alexis Bunton. I co-direct the Indigeneity program along with Kara Romero. And one of our initiatives at Bioneers in our Indigeneity program is a rights of nature tribal governance initiative that you'll hear more about later in this panel. And I just want to share an interesting anecdote. Uh, when we started working on the Rights of Nature Tribal Governance Initiative at Bioneers, I was so thrilled and I got one of those, this is what you posted 10 years ago things on my Facebook social media feed and I had a post from 2007 when Ecuador added Rights of Nature to its constitution, which Thomas was involved with. And I said something like, I sure want to be really involved with this movement. So fast forward <laughs> 10 plus years later, and I get to be doing this. Um, it's just a really important movement. So I'm here with Thomas Lindsay, who is the senior legal counsel for the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights, or CEDAR is their acronym. And also Frank Bebo. Um, he's an enrolled member of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe and also a tribal attorney. And also Samantha Skenendor. And Samantha is an enrolled citizen of the Ho-Chunk Nation. And she's an attorney of counsel at Quarles and Brady, which is a corporate firm. So she's really intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, if you want to learn more about them, you can easily look on the Bioneers website or the app for their extended bios, but I really want to get into this juicy discussion. So just to introduce Rights of Nature briefly, Rights of Nature is a movement to give nature rights to evolve, flourish, and... Um, and regenerate itself by codifying it into law. It's really quite different than current environmental law. It gets ahead of environmental de destruction and threats uh, that a current environmental law is not able to do. And um, it can protect any range of environmental threats through this legal mechanism from extraction to pollution to clear cutting to burning to uh, introducing invasive species. And it was really started as a movement, amazingly, right here in the United States in 2006, when the first law was passed by Tamaqua Borough, which Thomas <laughs> was involved in, and he'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, but really, we also think of this law, uh, this movement as a way of indigenizing the law, because while Western legal mechanisms are really quite new, in the scheme of all of life on Earth. Uh, indigenous peoples have always had natural laws that have been passed on from generations of living in place. And across many of our native communities, these laws recognize nature as an inherent, in many different ways, it's very complicated to describe, but as an inherent being in itself, um, that there are life forces that have just as many quote-unquote rights. It's very hard to put these concepts into English. They're really much better explained in the languages that the tribes use and understand from living in place. But this idea is not new to indigenous communities at all. So the Rights of Nature movement really marries indigenous worldviews and ways of being and ways of stewarding and being a part of nature instead of apart, apart from nature to the legal system that we all live, in, live under at this time. So I'm going to start with the first question. And the first question I'm going to direct first to Thomas, which is how did you first get involved with Rights of Nature? Thanks, Alexis. I think, uh, I think to start off, nobody really talks about Rights of Nature stuff unless they've been frustrated by the existing system that has so far failed us in terms of environmental protection. And my journey was, was no different. Uh, I started out uh, practicing for about 10 years, doing what I refer to lovingly as conventional traditional environmental law, which is basically about arguing over permits. 
uh, state issues a permit for a frack wastewater injection well or a factory hog farm. And environmental lawyers today basically come in after the fact and argue that the agency somehow made a mistake in issuing the permits. Unfortunately for us, and a lot of people know this who have been involved in activism, but the corporations that are ostensibly supposed to be regulated by these regulations are the very corporations that are writing the regulations in the first place. And so in essence, environmental lawyers are coming in after the fact to try to enforce corporate written regulations against the very corporations that wrote them in the first place. And then we seem astounded when there's no space in the legal system for us to actually win. Uh, because we, we weren't the ones writing the rules, yet we're trying to come in under those same rules uh, to do something for the communities which we represent. So for about 10 years, we represented a couple hundred communities facing frack wastewater injection wells and factory hog farms and fracking and mineral extraction, all kinds of things. And we ran into dead ends through this environmental regulatory system and started looking for uh, different ways to protect nature and, and the communities that we were representing. And that brought us to a small community uh, called Tamaqua Borough, just northwest of Philadelphia, that was uh, dealing with a situation in which uh, PCB-laden, polychlorinated biphenyl-laden uh, dredge was being hauled in from the Delaware River into this small community of Tamaqua to dump uh, into open mine pits there. And in talking with the community about the fact they didn't want it, because surprise, the community didn't want to become a toilet for PCB-laden dredge coming into their community, uh, that we uh, came across a law review article written by a lawyer uh, back in the 70s. Uh, his name was Christopher Stone. And the law review article that he wrote uh, that was titled, What if Trees Had Standing? In other words, what if nature actually had standing in court uh, to bring actions against these kinds of projects? Not just humans who use nature, who then go into court to argue that their use of nature or enjoyment of nature is somehow interfered with by this project, but what if nature itself was able to come into court? It was this huge new concept to us. And we ended up talking with the elected officials and community in Tamaqua Borough, this very small community of 7,000 people, and eventually ended up writing the first rights of nature law in the world, which recognized that waterways and ecosystems within Tamaqua Borough had a right to exist and flourish and regenerate. Basically, think about them as constitutionally based kind of standards. You know, under the U.S. Bill of Rights and under state constitutions, you and I have rights to due process and equal protection. Basically, broad, constitutionally protective standards for humans, for people. And so, just think about legally enforceable human rights type civil rights for nature. That's what we're talking about when we talk about rights of nature. And the folks in Tamaqua became the first, I think, to a lot of people's amazement, uh, to adopt a rights of nature law, which recognized that ecosystems in that particular community were not property anymore, that they had rights of their own. Because of course, under our system of law, either you're treated as uh, an, uh, an individual or a person that has rights under the law, or you're treated as property. Those are basically the two distinctions that constitutional law makes uh, under the law. And of course, women were property in the 1840s, slaves were property in the 1850s, to some extent, uh, populations of the United States are still have elements of that slavery code uh, up in, even up until today. But under the system of law, we kind of divide things out into persons, things with rights, uh, versus property. And so the Tamaqua Borough law kind of resounded around the world. It echoed around the world when it was first passed. Uh, we got called uh, into Ecuador to assist with the new uh, constitution that the people of Ecuador were drafting. Uh, and Bioneers played a crucial role uh, in connecting us with the folks working in Ecuador who were working on the new constitution. Uh, so we were able to go and, and help them draft the language that became the new constitution in 2008 for the country of Ecuador, uh, which recognized ecosystems and natural communities across the country uh, at the national level via a constitutional framework uh, as having rights, legally enforceable rights. And in Ecuador, you saw the first couple of cases in which ecosystems were plaintiffs. So again, it kind of bends our brains to think of rights for nature, but also bends our brains to think of nature actually directly enforcing those rights. So one of the first cases in Ecuador was the Vilcabamba River versus the province of Loja, and it was the river itself that was the plaintiff. So I think rights of nature kind of stretches our brains in a lot of different ways. Uh, but I'm of the opinion, have been for a while, that without a structural paradigm shift, 
uh, in the way that the legal system treats nature that we're constantly going to be on the defense, uh, trying to play catch up uh, as these projects go forward and we're always on the defense. So that's kind of how I got my start. It was a frustration with existing environmental law and then moving into actually trying to create something new. How about you, Frank? Well, most of my rights of nature work has been with Tom in the last, I don't know, I'd say six, seven years it seems like now. Wild rice, monoman, has been around my life all my life. I mean, you know, ever since I was a kid, my grandfather always made sure we had wild rice. You know, it was important for my father to make sure we understood, you know, how to go out and harvest and things. And, and so I've, I've been around wild rice a long time. And then back in 85, uh, Winona Leduc and I connected up with the legislature in Minnesota, and they were, they were doing farm to patty rice. And... You know, that's a direct threat to us economically as well as to the environment. And so that was a concern for us. Probably by 2000, they were looking at uh, GMOs for wild rice. Um, interestingly enough, wild rice possesses a genome that allows it to lay on the bottom of the water for maybe up to 17 years and then germinate and, and ripen, you know, and, and grow. And so they want to take that same genome out of the wild rice and put it into a bunch of other vegetables like tomatoes and while they're green and storming giant warehouses like this, and then pull them out and ripen them up years later maybe, you know, just from you know, extracting that genome and all. So we've had a lot of different issues with wild rice, and it's been hard to get in front of it. And, and so when we started looking, as I say we, Winona and I and others, we were looking at a defense mechanism, not just for wild rice in our environment, but even what was going on with line three in the pipelines. And so as you look at trying to defend the territory where we live, you know, we live at the upper end of the Mississippi River, and that's the first 300 miles is all waters, water, uh, wetlands and tributaries, just all the stuff that, you know, begins. Three of the four watersheds of North America meet about a half hour from where I live. And so that's as high up as you can get. That's where all the fisheries are, are in Minnesota. And so we started looking at first... When Tom and I and uh, Winona and others were talking, we were talking about rights of a river. But it was hard for me to figure out how to get in front of the river because the Mississippi River and our watershed probably has 30 dams. And they're probably all Corps of Engineers. And so that's a hard group to get in front of and to try to get some authority over and tell them what to do and any of that stuff. And so in our frustration, I guess, Winona said, well, if we can't do that, what about wild rice? Wild rice was much more obvious for me. Wild rice is mentioned in our 1837 treaty. It says that we have the right to hunt, fish, and gather wild rice on the rivers, lakes, and lands that we're relinquishing or seeding. And so that meant all of the same territory, not just a reservation, but all of the same territory that we were relinquishing, we still had the right to hunt, fish, and gather. So in reality, by using rights of monoman, for me, it's a water strategy, a water protection strategy. Monoman wild rice grows in the water. Water is necessary for all living life. And where we live, because of all the, the fisheries and the flyways for the waterfowl and everything that's there, it's very important to have a lot of pristine water. And as I started looking through some of our treaty journals, interestingly enough, our treaty journals talk about Maple being maple syrup, maple sugar, and fish being our two primary treaty source foods besides wild rice that's expressly in our treaty. So you're talking about maybe three of the most high demand water quality, you know, natural elements in nature that we relied upon as our primary treaty foods. And so when you start looking at the way the, the decisions are for uh, different tribes, like the salmon and things like that. If it's a primary treaty food, there is an obligation for us to be able to access that food. That was part of the deal. And, and so as we're looking at line three and trying to figure out what we could do, we saw Monoman across all of our territories as the logical defense. Part of the problem is as you're trying to develop these defenses, you're in competition with a lot of other attorneys. And those attorneys, they don't see this very well. 
It's new to them. They didn't learn it in law school. They haven't practiced with it. And so they, they are hesitant and they try to slow you down sometimes because they think they understand how the, the system works, the federal system, the state system. And they do understand how it works, but they don't know how to understand how to prevail in it. Because like Tom was saying, it's set up by the industry. It's set up for permitting. And so you can be a good attorney and you can understand what's going on, but if you're using the same system, it's trying the same thing you did yesterday and it's, it's crazy today, it was crazy the day before. And so when I look at rights of nature, I think it displaces things in a way from Indian country standpoint that the state and the federal and the non-Indians can't do. And so what we've done in Minnesota, at White Earth Reservation in particular, we've adopted the rights of nature into rights of monoman. And we've used that in tribal court. And there hasn't been any other litigation against states in tribal court because, you know, <laughs> we all thought you couldn't do it because of the 11th Amendment and, and things like that. But as you keep reading, and that's the downside of being an attorney, you start to see where there's holes in the system. They didn't contemplate that Indians were going to be around today. And so they didn't really pay attention to the laws that they left in place with us. And the Chippewa, we have 44 treaties with the United States. And so there's a lot more power with our treaties. And what we found over time is that we have what you might call trade treaties. They go back even before the United States was formed. And so as a result, there are much better negotiations than surrender treaties. And there's a lot of tribes that have had to take terms that were very, very bad, and they haven't had a very good way to protect their resources. And because of where we were, and because of the cases that we've been involved in, we've found that our treaties are considered exclusive from the control of the Congress and, and the United States and from the state, and that Congress can change that but Congress has to get together to change what our treaty rights say. And that's what makes it different for us. And that's why it looks like we're probably doing a lot more because we have that right. But I perceive that other tribes that don't have the same language that we have still have those rights retained or reserved and just didn't relinquish them, but haven't argued them because they didn't understand how important it might be now. And so I think treaty rights are you're going to see a lot more use in the environment and a lot more use in the legal playing field. This decision, we're waiting on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals right now, and I suspect that they're going to tell Minnesota DNR that they're going to have to go back to tribal court. And when that happens, I think you're going to see a lot more tribal laws with rights of nature, and Tom's going to be working in his sleep and <laughs> helping a lot of people out. And that's what we have to do, is we have to help each other out. And so, you know, I've had that opportunity with Sam, I've had it with Tom, you know, and, and there's other people. So it, it is growing. It is a new, a new approach. And, and I think you're going to find that working with tribes is going to make the difference. Yes. And playing off of that, I think what's really important too is, is to look at how we've, we've litigated cases to show that nature does have rights and how they have panned out. All the different angles, like these two attorney colleagues of mine sitting next to me that have fought that battle in a framework that wasn't quite built for that fight as they've already explained. Um, part of my role coming in and working with the indigeneity program with Alexis and Kara is actually to first assess the landscape. What are the mechanical structures around a rights of nature case where tribal sovereignty and their, their, their political status can be used to, to draft or pass the, the right type of nature law for that jurisdiction, for that time, for that political scenario, in order for that law to be not just enforced, but also spill, like Frank described, and, and be contagious into other jurisdictions, including our, our sister and brother jurisdictions of state and local government. So with the program, the indigeneity program, um, one of the first tasks that, that I've come on to be outside counsel to, to Alexis and Kara is to say, what's the lay of the land? Where have tribes passed these rights of nature laws? Where have they fallen short? Um, where have they just been symbolic? What are ways maybe that we should look at to help tribes with the toolkit um, to look at this, this opportunity for them to kind of flex their sovereignty muscle and, and see if they can perhaps you know, advance 
this new area of, of what I think in American jurisprudence would call it environmental law, so 2.0, of, of having a whole new viewscape on how we see our resources around us. And so um, my job has, has really, in more recent times, um, working with the program, is to really look at that landscape and think about if, um, if we approach lay people, the tribal community, our, our allies, again, our, our partner, sister brother, jurisdictions near us, um, you know, taking it from a holistic perspective, how do we solve this problem? How do we go ahead and do this in the best way that we now know? We have more precedents, we have no, more information from Frank and Tom's cases now that we know what to do, what not to do, and how to do things better. And so 2022, you know, Bioneers is in the place where, where we can actually assess all of those things um, from a legal standpoint, from a political standpoint, from a human standpoint, and come up with real solutions. So our toolkit that we've developed, probably I would say in about a year, um, my involvement has been to sit down with the legal intern with Britt, and I don't know if Britt is here. I don't see her. Um, is, is to, um, can you wave your hand, Britt? This poor, this poor young woman has had so much time with me. <laughs> um, we have sliced and diced all of the casework from water law, other environmental law, international law, and we've looked at things from all angles to say, we have tried to think of everything. And we have organized a toolkit that says, all right, if you're a tribe that is an uh, Indian Reorganization Act tribe, when you, were, when you were recognized as a federal tribe, a federal entity, a federal government, you know, how you were structured, how your constitution structured you, how you function as a government, does that make it better for you to pass the rights of nature's law? Or are you from Frank's neck of the woods? Do you have treaty rights, right? Is there special rules, rights, privileges that you might have that might allow you to pass the rights of nature law that would fit and be better upheld under those circumstances. And then we looked at some of the newer constitutions, some very modern forms of tribal governance, and then we looked at all of the case law, right? All of the water rights cases, um, all of the, the procedural, you know, regular American law cases, property cases, um, exceptions to those laws, and we identified all of the challenges um, so any attorney, it's basically a blueprint to say, here's all of the things you're going to face, and you're going to need to discuss with your client to say, hey, Tribe A, I think we can pass the rights of nature law. We check most of the boxes here. These are the three or four you know, big issues that we're going to have to tackle, and I'm going to be your counsel. I'm going to help you work through those three or four things, and then advise you accordingly to you know, U.S. Tribal Council to pass this law or that law or do whatever you choose to do. So that's really how we get tribes in a position to consider doing this. And that's really been my role with Rights of Nature is, is to create that blueprint and also take the feedback we're hearing from the tribal leaders, from their council, their community members, and we've even talked to local and state DNR, so non-native allies that say, hey, we've been waiting for tribes to do this for some time. What can we do to help? And so part of the strategic vision and plan will have to be so inclusive um, to bring that to the table to tribal governments so that they, are, they really can do this. Thank you, Sam. Um, yes, this is really, really <laughs> exciting work that we're doing. And one thing that Sam and Britt, and I'm sure Frank and Thomas have uncovered, is that rights of nature law, um, the complexity of it is also an opportunity. It crosses over many different types of law and many different types of jurisdictions and crossover spaces, but therein lie the pathways and the strategies forward, like Frank was saying, those little loopholes that you can find. And Samantha and Britt, everyone on this panel actually, have identified these in many different cases. And what's really exciting about federally recognized tribes adopting rights of nature is that it's looking like in many cases we are going to have to work with departments of natural resources and other municipal organizations, which makes it fan out beyond the tribes themselves. And there's also lots of opportunities in non-tribal municipalities and um, or organizational governance. And I wanted to point out, and Frank, uh, Thomas, you can help me on this, because Rights of Nature is a growing, exploding movement. Um, we, our team has been talking to several tribes and several, many tribes have been contacting us saying, when can we explode this? When can you do some capacity building? It's all kind of bubbling up right now. It's really exciting. We can't name all the names just now. <laughs> but I think there's been, um, 
six tribes in the United States that have voted on tribal rights of nature rev resolutions of some sort. There have been um, almost two dozen municipalities who, in the U.S., non-tribal municipalities that have adopted rights of nature law. Uh, something like 19 countries. I'm watching for him to nod his head. In one form or another, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, in my work and when I do international work, I know that there are a lot of activists and attorneys in other countries, um, many in Europe, every, actually every continent in the world, where they're having these discussions. So if you're not hearing about it in the news that the law has been passed, it's not that it's not well on its way. So this is really, really exciting news. And so right now I'd like to ask each of you to share a different example of a particular Rights of Nature initiative that you're working on now or that you're familiar with or that you've been through recently so that our audience can understand just how um, diverse this movement is, which gives it such an opportunity to flourish and blossom and explode like we want it to. And I guess uh, we'll start with the OG here again. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, one thing that's important to note, I think, is that rights of nature work is not a spectator sport. It can happen anywhere. It can happen in any community. Any community has elected local officials who can pass rights of nature laws. But in the US, about half of the states have ballot initiative processes so that you can write rights of nature laws yourselves at the local level and then put it on the ballot and campaign for it and pass it and then begin to enforce it. Sometimes I think. Uh, sometimes rights of nature feels like it's 30,000 feet in the air. It's way up here and it's something for the lawyers to talk about. It's not. The lawyers are only relevant if there are people in the community who are moving forward to protect a particular ecosystem with this new approach. And again, I think without this new approach, we're kind of screwed in a variety of different ways because you're relegated back to industry-written environmental regulations which keep you running around like a hamster through a wheel. Uh, endlessly exhausting your resources and energy until you eventually disband yourself as a community organization. So wherever you are, it can be done. It's possible. Uh, and I think safeguarding major ecosystems this way is, is the next really major paradigm shifting evolution of the law in the US. But it's, be, it's being done by communities and by tribes. Uh, those are the folks on the front lines. So at any one time in the US, about a dozen efforts are underway on rights of nature work. Perhaps the most exciting stuff that I see uh, today uh, in the office are uh, Florida, of all places. Uh, Florida uh, became, uh, Orange County, Florida, became the largest uh, municipality in the United States to pass a rights of nature law back in November of 2020, uh, initially to protect the Wakaiva and Econ-Lakhachi rivers with certain rights. Uh, that was broadened out to give all waterways, all waters within Orange County certain rights. The ballot initiative passed in November with 89% of the vote. So folks that work on ballot initiatives know that you're lucky enough to get 51% of the vote most times, let alone 89% of the vote. Uh, and so Floridians argue and differ on every other issue apparently other than protecting the water there, which is under crisis right now with red tide and algae blooms and those types of things. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. Isn't Orange County like 50-50 Democrat and Republican, and the same thing with Tamaqua that was largely working class Republican. This is a really important thing. That's why I wanted to yes. interrupt you, because rights of nature, when people hear it as a movement, they inherently understand what it means in their hearts, and it's a nonpartisan issue. Yeah, I just wanted very to cut in. Very politically mixed, and in Orange County, you had Trump supporters who had, you know, vote yes on the initiative and their windows with posters and signs, and so it was an interesting mix of, of these kind of different political uh, ends to come together for this water protection law. And the most exciting thing in Florida at this point is that folks in Orange County have actually filed a lawsuit based on that Orange County law. And the lawsuit that was filed was to stop a 1,900-acre commercial housing development from moving forward to destroy over 100 acres of wetlands. Under the Orange County law, wetlands have rights. Waterways have rights. And one of those rights is to exist. You can't destroy them. It's a right to life for wetlands uh, within Orange County. The lawsuit uh, seeks to stop the developer from developing the project that would involve the destruction of these couple hundred, or a little over 100 acres of wetlands and waterways. Our argument in that case was just held. We're waiting for a decision by the judge. Other hot spots in the country, one is Oklahoma. 
Uh, there's an indigenous-led effort uh, in the city of Miami, Oklahoma, to protect a little place called Tar Creek, which was recently on the list of the 10 most endangered waterways uh, in the United States, subject of a Superfund site, uh, big issue moving forward in that particular area. Uh, other hotspots include upstate New York. There's a group there working to protect the St. Lawrence River. And in fact, just last week, uh, introduced into the uh, Canadian House of Commons. So the national legislature in Canada was a bill to recognize the St. Lawrence River as having rights. So the bill may not go anywhere this session, but it's a, it's a marker of, I think, how far we've come in that a national legislature, that, in this case Canada, which had never seen national legislation along these lines before, has introduced this particular bill to recognize the St. Lawrence River as having rights. Uh, other exciting things, in South Carolina, there's a group beginning to marry climate change issues with rights of nature. What does it look like if the climate has rights? The atmosphere has rights. What, what, what does this mean from a legal perspective about how we, how we come to these different uh, issues? And so across the US, a, a bunch of different efforts uh, moving at this point. Uh, those are some of the hotspots, at least from our, from our perspective in terms of the cases. I would say the biggest hotspot nationally at this point is really these tribal cases that have been brought. So Frank talked about uh, the a white earth band uh, filing this case in the name of Monoman or wild rice against the, tar, uh, against the Line 3 tar sands oil pipeline and how that pipeline uh, and a specific water uh, taking permit associated with the pipeline has affected and will affect wild rice or Monoman. And the second case, which we'll talk about in a little while, is the Sauk Suattle tribe in Washington State uh, who has sued in the name of salmon against dams that are impeding salmon uh, transportation up the Skagit River in Washington State. So again, it's kind of hard to understand these rights of nature laws until they're actually enforced. It doesn't really do any good if they sit on the bookshelf. Uh, they actually have to actually change something real uh, because that's, that's what their rationale is, but these are some of the ways in which they're starting to change the landscape. Well, and I, I, I think my favorite case, just to kind of go up past that, is the one that's happening with the Seattle and uh, Jack Fyander out there working with them. So he's working with rights of the salmon, and if you're not familiar with how the laws have been developing out there, there was a case called culverts versus salmon, and whether the culverts had to be taken out so that the salmon can s migrate and swim back upstream where they're supposed to be, and also where the, a lot of the tribes agreed to go and live through the treaties. And if your treaty food isn't getting to you, then then there's a problem. And so they estimated it might cost something like two to three billion dollars to remove all of those culverts and change them so that they're passable for the fish, which to me is interesting because it costs two to three billion dollars to build the pipeline that we're fighting. And we haven't even started on problems that it's creating. That's just building the pipeline. So when you try to figure out these value systems, it's, it's a little odd. But the thing that I like about the rights of salmon, and this is just for me simply, um, the rights of Monoman, I think, is important because wild rice is in the treaty itself. That's the supreme law of the land under the Constitution of the United States. And so I think that's going to help us in that way with our litigation. But if we didn't have wild rice written into our treaty, you know, we're people of the river, we're people of the canoe, the woods, we would be doing fish. And that's what the salmon is. And so what I tell people is, you know, a lot of people haven't even heard of wild rice. And so if I'm trying to describe wild rice as essentially what might look like a grain crop in a field across the water, people can be standing beside it and not know it. People can have it on their plate and not know it. So it's not really the model in my mind, but the fish is the model because everybody knows what a fish looks like. Everybody knows a fish in a goldfish bowl and everybody knows what a dead fish looks like. And if you see a thousand dead fish, you know there's something wrong with the water. You don't have to have a scientist come up and tell you that. And so that gives you, I think, a big leap in terms of what your barometer is in the environment and what's going on with the water because we look at protecting the water where I live and we believe if we can protect the water, then we're protecting almost everything else. And so I think fish are gonna become the lead barometer, but I'm glad to see all the other things that are happening. And I was very glad to see the uh, saguaro cactus be one of those. And, and so it's very interesting how the different cultures look at their relationship with maybe the, what we might call the most significant part of our culture and what we would want to guard and protect for our future generations as much as for ourselves now. And I think that's what's gonna 
make it work also better for us as tribal members because it is spirituality. It is freedom of religion. You know, they only passed the Indian Religious Freedom Act back in 1978. Otherwise, we were being prevented from practicing and, and doing these things. So we have a lot of things that are helping us right now that'll help everybody else. And I think you're going to see fish is going to be it. Right, I, I agree, I agree. There's um, a lot of different ways to skin a cat, as they say, which is not a popular saying, but you know, being hired to, to look at all the different ways you, we can really accomplish this is, is, you know, it, is it going to be a species? Is it going to be a body of water? Is it going to be a creek or a river? Is it gonna be you know, headwaters, source waters, a spring site? Will it be flora, will it be fauna, will it be some subgroup within those groups? Um, what, what do these laws actually look like? If I handed you a piece of paper um, and said this is Tribe X's uh, rights of nature law, what, did they, what was the purpose of the law? What are they trying to protect exactly? And, and really, you know, the, the answer is you know, every lawyer's dream. It depends, right? It depends on what that tribe wa wants to protect, thinks it can protect, um, and will go to some measure to protect it. Um, at that time, right? So we don't know if it's going to be a fish or a specific species of fish or if it's going to be this waterway or this tree or this particular area or maybe it's the wolves, the wolves in general. Um, and, and to really kind of think about that, I think if I, if I came to this workshop and knew nothing about you know, um, rights of nature, I would say, well, what are we protecting and, and how, what does that look like? I can't envision it. And, and I guess the, to me the answer is, um, you know, what, what have I worked on? I, I would work on saying, from the real perspective, it's, it's how that tribe would see you know, the threat of harm to something that is very precious, beyond words, beyond even the English language, to, to talk about what that means. Um, I had the lucky privilege of working for my tribe's traditional court. Um, and the traditional court at Ho-Chunk Nation in Wisconsin is made up of um, the eldest male living clan leader in our tribe. And those eldest male living clan leaders hold all the stories. They hold all that traditional ecological knowledge, and, and they are the keepers of that. That's the way our people have done it for, for thousands and thousands of years. And you know, as you can tell, I'm a woman, right? <laughs> so the traditional court's made up of, of men. Um, we used to have 16 clans at Ho-Chunk, and we are down to 12 clans. Um, some have gone extinct over time. So the burden of those stories has weighed heavier on those other clans, right? Um, and we've also have Native American church now is very, our people follow NAC ways. So they now have a seat at the table because they are also protectors of our, our ecological systems in our lands. So that's the way, those, that's where our, our, our knowledge comes from, from one tribe. So when we talk about, um, you know, something we're working on, something I've always worked on um, as being a member of the tribe and being a, a woman within the tribe and a, and a lawyer within the tribe and a cultural resources protector, sacred site protector for many years now, is we go to the source to find out what that means, how to protect it, how it's been protected to date. And that's precious knowledge. And so at the, at the heart of all of the rights of nature law comes that type of knowledge. And it's, it's, it's amazing to have access to that. So to the question of of what have you worked on? I have worked on um, having that firsthand um, relationship with those knowledge and the speakers and have learned case after case, sacred site after sacred site, waterway, spring site, all these cases that I've worked on in the last 17 years of practice, I've been able to learn um, what is the rights of nature from my tribe. Not wholly, I'm still very much a, a junior baby student. There's so much more to learn. And, and so um, our tribe is one of the few tribes Alexis had mentioned had passed the rights of nature law, and we've passed it on a very preliminary basis. And for our tribe, we have one of the newest constitutions out of all tribes in the country. Our, our constitution was adopted in 1994. We used to be known as the Winnebago um, of Wisconsin, and there's the Winnebago of Nebraska, which is our other relatives that are further west. Um, we have, so we're separate federally recognized tribes. We changed our name back to what we always called ourselves, was, which is the Hochangra, which is people of the big voice. And so in 1994, we adopted that constitution, changed our name back, and we created a very sophisticated form of government. And this is important to understand with rights of nature is how does that government work? We have an executive, judicial, legislative, and we have a fourth branch of government called general counsel. And general counsel sets the policy, and it's, it's represented by the people. So we have a whole different pillar, um, you know, not these three, not this tripod, we have a table of four legs that, that create the, the, the body of government for the Ho-Chunk Nation. So it, 
as a policymaker, as a general counsel, took it upon themselves for one of, one of my you know, European kinship way uncles, Bill Greendeer, who is, has been a paramount you know, environmental justice warrior for his entire life. Um, I think he spent a lot of time here in California as well. He worked very hard within our tribal community to garner up the votes that were needed to pass um, a, a resolution that gave nature, and this is nature, all nature, right? Not any subspecies, not any group, subgroup. All of nature was to be included in our constitution and be afforded the Bill of Rights, just like we as human beings have within our tribal constitution. So if we passed a law over here to save the salmon, or on a very extreme version of rights of nature, we're protecting all nature and giving it a Bill of Rights like personhood, that's the strongest way we can, we can um, protect nature. And that's what passed with over, I believe, 1,200 votes, 1,200 human beings in a room, tribal members passed that law passed that law. So it, it was beautiful. I mean, mm -hmm. and it was great to be in the room. We all stopped and took a picture. We put a banner out about rights of nature and we all took a picture and I wish I had it here on the screen to show you, but we were very proud of that law. But that's only phase one. Under the new constitution, again, the, the good and the bad of it, it, it's only phase one. We have to go back and that, that law has to be taken to the legislature. It has to be, go through a process with the feds and then it becomes law, right? And then we have to go through what Tom and Frank said, we have to have these cases in tribal court, we have to litigate them and the cards are going to fall, right? And where that law begins and ends in terms of enforcement. So we are not quite there yet, but um, that's really my contribution to say, you know, I've been a part of this since before it was passed and, you know, it's in the process, but we're looking at it from an extreme level, right? So watch Ho-Chunk Nation, watch what happens um, for this tribe as they move that, that law forward. Thank you, Sam. I'd like to respond to a few of the things I heard in, that, in the responses to that question. And what comes top of mind for me is um, thinking about corporations influencing our laws and regulatory processes in the United States. That's fairly new within the last 200 years or so, I'd say. Probably a lot of it done in the last 100 years, made in the last 100 years, especially as extraction has ramped up. Um, but if we take a step back, Frank was talking about treaties. And treaties, a lot of people don't, you're not, you're very, you're done, most Americans are done a disservice because we're not really taught properly about what treaties are and what they mean in our public classrooms growing up. And what treaties are, they come from international law that predates the establishment of the United States. And they were ways for newly formed nation states to make agreements with each other to determine who had the rights to what. And so when, when before the US became a country, when the revolutionaries wanted to break away from England and legitimize themselves as a new nation, one way to do that was through treaty law and to make treaties with the established nations that were already on the land, and that was the tribes. So therein, in creating treaties, the new US government was legitimized in the eyes of the old world of being a country. They're a sovereign nation that can make treaties with other sovereign nations, which is the tribes in the US. And so um, we've kind of alluded to it throughout this talk, but sovereignty means that tribes have a nation to nation relationship with the United States. Now it's a little bit complicated in our, uh, in our federal law and our history of law, this sovereign relationship. Tribes are, um, have a lot of sovereign rights, but they're also considered domestic dependent nations. So that's something that's really gonna change as we test out this rights of nature law. And of course also, it goes without mention that treaties were made and many tribal leaders were coerced at the hands of not having their food supply, at the hands of genocide, uh, even having fake authorities sign them. So that's a whole nother panel for someday. But it gives tribes the ability to deal with the US government and the legal system in a different way than municipalities and other uh, forms of governance in the US. But I wanna go back even a step further in time and think about what Tom mentioned earlier about um, legal systems being property rights based. Those legal systems have only really begun to be formed in the last 
thousand years or so. They kind of came on board as we saw the um, increasing feudalism turn into industrialism and during the, the um, age of exploration, which was really all about um, the expansion of capitalism and colonialism which go, and resource extraction, which all goes hand in hand. But prior to those property laws, everybody who was in Western Europe or wherever those laws emerged in that time, I know they existed in other parts of the world that are often erased because we center the West, but I digress. Anyway, um, even, let's say, what we call the West uh, in Europe, even anybody in this room who has ancestors from there or any part of the world, your ancestors would have related to nature in the same way that our tribal nations have. Ours have just held on to it a lot longer. So everybody has that, um, that in their ancestry and deep down in their core of who they are. So I wanted to take a step back before I take a step forward because many of our tribes in North America have this concept called seventh generation thinking or a seventh generation principle. I've heard it articulated as um, you have to look seven generations back when you're making a decision and at the same time look seven generations forward. I've also heard it articulated as you are the third generation in between seven with uh, three behind you and three ahead of you. Either way, and, and then there's many tribal nations that have words for it that basically mean the same thing, but it's not. It's just that you can't make a decision now without thinking about the past and the future at the same time. So that's why I wanted to kind of go back in history thinking about the law and how relatable this is to everybody. And so with that, I'm going to share the last question before we go to Q&A, which is, let's imagine the future, let's, and not call it a radical future, call it the future we all deserve <laughs> as part of nature. And where can this movement go? What is the promise? And what do we need to do to get there? And how can people help and get involved? So I think, uh, I think what we're seeing now is indigenous communities really taking a, a leadership role in moving forward rights of nature laws. And we have to understand also, which took me a while because I had to come up to speed with Frank's help on everything mm -hmm. treaty related and indigenous uh, law databases. But uh, the, the fact is, is that when tribes pass these rights of nature laws or when tribal members pass these laws through general counsel process and other processes that the tribe has to make law, it's not that they're trying to control their own behavior on the reservation that they're attempting to get at. They're attempting to get at activities that are happening off the reservation that are interfering with treaty rights or affecting the ecosystem that's been protected under the tribal law. So imagine a river having rights. A river is not stationary. But if a tribe passes a law protecting the river itself as having rights on the reservation, then automatically you have a legal right to enforce that law outside of the reservation. So in Frank's case, where the state of Minnesota issued a water taking permit that affected the water supply for the growth and well-being of monoman or wild rice, both on the reservation and off the reservation under treaty rights that the tribe holds, there needs to be a mechanism for the tribe to hold the state responsible for issuing that particular permit because it affects adversely the ecosystem that the tribe is attempting to protect. So I think, in a way, indigenous communities are not just regulating themselves through these laws. They're actually attempting to control the actions that are occurring by Western municipalities and by states that are interfering or destroying those ecosystems that those rights of nature laws are intended to protect. So I, I think in a broad sense, that's that's like one of the big takeaways is indigenous communities leading the way, not just to regulate their own behavior, but actually to attack and to try to stop these really bad projects that are conceived by Western governments and by the state and by private corporations. So that's a biggie. I think the other things that we're going to see are rights of nature applied to different uh, things that have been applied in the past. People have talked about rights of nature being applied to rivers, you know, it's been applied to forests, it's been applied to other ecosystems, but thinking about the climate or the atmosphere as an element of the earth that has certain rights, what does that look like? That's a very uh, interesting conversation that I think we can start to have as well. The Sauk Suatl tribe case that we've referred to uh, today is also groundbreaking because the tribe brought a lawsuit without having passed a rights of nature law. 
There's no written rights of nature law uh, that was passed by the Soxhoatl tribe. They're relying on customary law, saying that the customary law of the tribe, not the written law of the tribe, actually recognizes salmon as having rights. So the lawsuit was brought on behalf of that customary law. So I think that's a groundbreaking kind of initiative because it takes us out of written law uh, as being the basis for rights of nature enforcement and into customary law of the tribe. So that's a, a very, very important piece. And, and just quickly, two other things. We've talked about, uh, Alexis uh, talked about, you know, the difference, this property-based system of law that we have in the West. It's important to understand, uh, and I think most people do from a knee-jerk level, that the Western system of law that we have is much, much different than the indigenous value systems that we talk about. The Western system of law, the one that I think most of us live within, uh, treats nature as property. It's something to be owned, which means under this system, the more you own, the more you can destroy. So think about that. The more you own, the more land you can own, the more ecosystems you can own under the system of law, the more you can destroy. Because part of your right as a property owner under a Western system of law is the right to destroy what you own. So you can literally you know, airstrip a 50-acre piece of land that has ecosystems on it. You have the right to do that as part of your property ownership. Sir Francis Bacon, I think, and I, we probably didn't think we'd be talking about Sir Francis Bacon today, but <laughs> Sir Francis Bacon, an English philosopher, once said that the goal of Western civilization was to stretch and torture nature on a rack to extract her secrets. That's kind of how Western law sees nature, extracting her secrets by putting her on a medieval torture instrument. That's how Western law sees nature as subordinate, as property to be used, to be exploited. Indigenous value systems are much different. Uh, those systems see nature as a relative, as a living being, as something much different than property or this subordinate thing to be extracted and used. So the rights of nature laws, you know, even though they're ink on paper, are really just uh, evidence that a sea change is starting to happen along value system lines, that indigenous value systems, in this case, are starting to really poke into that Western system of law sometimes involuntarily, i.e. forcefully, uh, by attempting to change that Western system of law with those indigenous value systems through these rights of nature instruments or vehicles. So I think on a, on a big level that's what's happening. And the, the final thing that it really excites me in terms of the evolving, what's happening now, is that people are, are thinking about nature in different ways. And the rights of nature movement was very important, is very important, and has been, you know, to that makes me feel old, but 2006 was the original law back in Tamaqua Borough. I think what's starting to happen now is people are thinking of beyond rights of nature in some ways, that rights of nature is really a platform to have these other conversations. But what does it look like, for example, when we get rid of private ownership of ecosystems? What does it mean for a forest to own itself, for example? What does it mean to get rid of this concept of a deed? And we don't pretend to have all the answers, but we have a couple projects going that are going to talk about and, and create legal instruments and structures for that to happen. Uh, because after all, private ownership of ecosystems is kind of all made up. You know, the English came over, they chopped up the indigenous land, uh, put it into numbered parcels, and then we all kind of have bought numbered parcels over the years. But it's all artificial. It's not biosystem, you know, it's, it's not according to any bioregions, it's not according to any ecosystems, it's just lines drawn that somebody said, you can now own this and have dominion over it. So the question is, from a, from a perhaps more radical standpoint, is how do we begin to unravel that? And I think rights of nature is a start because you begin to take a couple of those bundles, those sticks out of the bundle of rights when you talk about nature having rights. But in addition, when you talk getting rid of private ownership, what does it look like for a guardianship model to emerge that actually has legal standing? Not just something we talk about, but what happens if a forest, ownership of a forest is able to return to the forest itself? And that's an exciting new concept, I think, that is being wrapped into some of the rights of nature work that's being done today. The thing about property rights that makes it interesting is, as, as a tribal member, all of the things that are being talked about right now, we consider gifts from the creator. We don't consider ourselves owners of anything. But 
we've been convinced under the mainstream law that what we have is property rights. We have the right to go out and hunt, fish, and gather, and they are a usufructory right to use the resources of that land. And so when you start talking about the seven generations and looking back on what should be preserved for the future generations and what you need to do to be responsible in that way for those generations, you have to think in terms of property rights and you have to argue in terms of property rights. And so when you're talking about how property is divided, and Tom was talking about that with numbers and things, there's only a couple of models really in a sense. And one of them is a 50-50 model and that's out in Washington and other places with the fisheries where they figure that the, all the Indians get half and then the non-Indians get half. But the problem is it's all the Indians. It's not just a tribe with treaties, but all the same Indians who are all crunched together have that same half to share. And we have some of that in Minnesota, but we do thirds. And so there's one third for the tribes, one third for the non-Indians, and then a third for nature to supposedly you know, keep itself together. But in reality, it's, it's the state. The state is compromising everything. I think the state is selling resources much past 60-70% of what exists. They're letting the water be degraded. They're, they've let a lot of the resources in the fisheries go bad. And, and, and so they're not regenerating the way they're supposed to. The state is, is the culprit in most of what's going on. They, they look to the new, the new the way of making money from what they think is still theirs. And so they're very hard on wanting to keep tribal members oppressed and keep us from being able to harvest in places and, and say that you can't do that here or try to arrest us for those things. And so even in Minnesota right now, when I look at these concepts of property rights and treaty rights, you know, for us as Chippewa, we would call ourselves the Anishinaabe, but we have 44 treaties called Chippewa with the United States. And so for us, when we look at these these opportunities to protect a vast territory. Our, our territory goes across a lot of the Great Lakes. They say it's 800 miles across and 1,000 miles north and south. We were maybe the second largest tribe in North America. So when we start looking at what those resources are and what we need and how do we protect those, I think we have to stop the states from being pretending that they're in control. They're the ones who are being very reckless and they just keep hoping that these resources are gonna regenerate themselves. And that's not what's happening. And so when I look at the concept of property, we have to look at it as an argument under the law of the mainstream people because that's the only law that they understand and respect. And, and while we're doing things in tribal court that are gonna change that, we still have to talk about it like it's our property, like we have a right to defend our property. And so even when we're doing line three stuff and with the oil, the water protectors, the tribal water protectors, we've set that up with rights of nature as well, where tribal water protectors have a right to defend wild rice. It's part of our culture, it's part of our spirituality. And to prosecute us or say we can't defend something like that, I mean, that would be like saying you can't defend your church. And so people need to understand how we think about these things and how they can be changed. And, and so I don't like to use that word property, but we're going to be stuck with that word for a long, long time. And so from a food sovereignty, food security kind of standpoint, we have to claim our property, we have to defend our property, and we have to become maybe, maybe more in your face about that. And that's not who we are. But if you're gonna take people's food away, you're gonna take people's livelihood away, and you're gonna make it hard for everybody in the future to breathe and have clean water to drink, then we don't have a lot of choices left. And so, you know, you're gonna see a lot more stand up, I think, in Indian country. Yeah, bravo. <laughs> Um, this leads me to um, probably the end of many, many conversations I've had with Alexis and Britt as we've you know, spent hours and hours piecing together the, the legal toolkit, the outline, the considerations, um, exactly what Frank just said is we live in this consumerism world, this property-laden culture within the law. Um, as Tom described, you know, the environmental law here would have to have a, have a pivotal shift, right? It has to be a cultural shift, and, and who has the biggest influences on culture? Um, obviously, the property owner and obviously corporations, and Alexis pointed to that needle to say that that's got to be part of the strategy because we, we absolutely, when you look at things, that's actually, absolutely a big part of the game. Um, and so when... when when we get to the point where we have to still play the old, the current game, which is the property concept game, um, 
Frank is absolutely right with that. We can't really do anything probably the next several years or even generation or two unless it, it really plays off that property component. The courts and the judges are just not staffed. They're not competent. They, don't, they haven't been integrated with the culture of some of the things we're talking about that tribes would move. The, tribes themselves are just now adopting these rights. And we talk about it just being common law. And common law meaning it is what it is when the question gets asked before the court. So, you know, if there's a salamander that's, that's special to the tribe until there's a case um, that falls in that common law and the tribe comes back with his cultural expertise and validates that right of nature, that right of that salamander, that's when that would come up. It doesn't need to be written anywhere. So that's how that would play out. But again, you know, what these laws look like, we want them to have a real impact. And maybe they're symbolic early on while we try to take the property concept and bring it down and bring the rights of nature values up, right? There's a process to all of this in the democracy system um, and in the corporate system and capitalism, there's ways to do that. Um, and really how that strategy works is super important and it's important for you know, folks at Bioneers, folks in the audience, us as attorneys to be aware of what those variables are to get here. You know, and I, and I personally don't think, you know, screaming at things we don't like is going to get us always where we need to be. If we're actually looking for uh, the, the paradigm shift in the law, the cultural shift, so that those laws in Indian, Indian jurisdiction splattered from East Coast to West Coast really take off, not just within the United States, but internationally, right? We need our, our brothers and sisters north and south of us and east and west of us to also play into this value shift to really make it meaningful. Um, because the alternative is, the rights of nature will come after you one way or another, right? <laughs> we, we are, uh, you know, and we can't, we can't sit here and not say there's a doomsday coming, because that's why you're all interested, right? There's a doomsday coming where we run out of things, or we've, we've poisoned things, and where our, our human population and, and our own well-being is, is absolutely threatened, because the rights of nature will come for you. And, and they have. I mean, we talked about earlier, we talked about flooding, we've talked about global warming, global impact. If we don't shift and have this shift from property to pro value of, of, um, of nature, rights of nature, it's going to happen anyway. So whether we get in front of the problem um, and do it this way and how we do it strategically is, is probably, for me, the most important. Um, you know, we, we, it's not important for us, you know, to, to say from from pioneers, this is what needs to happen. I think we all know what needs to happen, but we need to really analyze how to get there and, and start you know, going through that, that exercise of, of shifting that. And, and right now, Frank is absolutely right, we have to say property. You know, we, have to, we have to go with tribes have our property, we're done letting it go to crap, we're done letting you do permits, permitting activities that there are not resources to permit. And we're, we're done doing that game, right? And so there's, there's a whole strategy behind, you know, going from that property um, concept and that game into the rights of nature game. And that's really the shift we're talking about here for rights of nature law. Thank you so much. So at this time, we are going to move into Q&A. But before we move into Q&A, I would like to do a lightning round. One minute or less from each of you. <laughs> what is one way people can get involved in the rights of nature movement? Uh, so we're kind of one note Johnny's, but the one thing you can do is write a law. And that may sound kind of funny to say because we don't see ourselves as lawmakers or law adopters. But I think we have to become that because there's been a complete failure of our governmental system at the state and federal level to do what's necessary to protect uh, these ecosystems. So surely we all come from a community where there needs to be an ecosystem that's protected. That means actually drafting a law and approaching local elected officials about passing it or doing it yourself. And we're kind of set up collectively to actually assist with that, support that process. Thank you, Tom. One minute. <laughs> Look at that clock right there. Okay, so <laughs> these, are, sure. these are lawyers. These are so lawyers. One minute That's is right. like tough. You know, rights of nature isn't everywhere where you are, and so sometimes it can be support through other mechanisms that you do through social media and things like that as well. It's hard to understand where to plug in and how to make it work because. I've tried to help Tom with some of the communities that are trying to do things, and, and maybe they're biting something too big. They want to they wanna do something that's just too big for themselves, and they don't have enough guidance or enough help. And, and so 
I would, I would advocate trying to follow what's going on with other groups. I, I think uh, fish are going to be the thing in the future, but you're going to have to pay attention and see when it happens where you're living because it's not very obvious. It takes time for it to happen. You know, the law that we have, Rights of Monoman, was adopted in 2018. I didn't use it until last August. You know, you got to have it ready. That's the real trick. Or you got to do what Jack did and use customary law, but that's an Indian thing. <laughs> oh, I'm going to go right to the punch. We need money. <laughs> <laughs> Not kidding you. Um, <laughs> I'm, yeah. As Alexis says, I'm corporate counsel. I've worked for over 20 some tribes over the last 17 years, and I solve big problems. And that's just what I do for a living. That's my job. I'm a solution person. And I'll tell you right now where we are. It took us less than nine months to come up with this legal toolkit. Um, we've shopped it around to a couple of tribes, East Coast, um, Midwest tribes. Every single tribe wants to do this that we talk to, right? And we even shopped it around to local municipalities, uh, local DNRs, and they want to partner with these tribes. So what gets us there, right? What is the one thing we need now? So we put a bunch of fire under these tribal governments this last nine months, ten months. Now, this, th this, those current administrations from those tribes are ready to do something and pass rights of nature. So. <laughs> These guys' cases can go a little bit better in court next time, right? And they're not bringing it in at the last, the last leg of the trip, right? So money. And why do we, what do we need money for? What would we use it for? And, and I'm not the boss of me. Kara and, and Alexis is the mm -hmm. boss of me. Um, I have told them and I've recommended that we bring in small pots of money to give to the tribes to outsource the final legal analysis for their own attorneys that are barred in each of those tribal jurisdictions, because most tribes have their own jurisdiction. Sometimes you have to take a bar exam. Sometimes you have to pass your character and fitness. Sometimes you just got to pay a fee. But if you're not competent or you're not licensed in that tribal jurisdiction, you don't have business working there as an attorney. And it's those attorneys that know that tribe and are counsel to that tribe that can finish the analysis off on telling them, is it a species? Is it a big bill of rights? Is it somewhere on polar ends here that we can advise you as your counsel in closed doors, you can have these discussions and you can walk out of here knowing you took the advice to your counsel or maybe you didn't take the advice to your counsel and you pass something, right? And that, that arms these guys in their fights for all of these, these you know, dire pressing things that are going on today. Um, and we need money to give to those lawyers of choice from that tribal government to let the government govern themselves and get them on that, get them on that last that last piece of business done so they can make a decision, an informed decision, and move ahead with that. Here's to self-governance, hey. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you stood up first, and I'm gonna go side to side alternating, so take it away. So Thomas, can you tell us the name of the documentary by Layla Connors, which I've shown in class, it's wonderful, on the work that you're doing? And even since that documentary a few years ago, there are so many more success stories. Yeah, so the, the movie was, is called We the People 2.0, and it talks about rights of nature, and it's done by a, a company called Tree Media, uh, Lila Connors and Matthew Schmidt. They do uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's uh, documentary uh, films, some of those documentary films, and so they worked on this film. It's been out for a while, but it's a good rights of nature kind of primer. Thank you. And now we have a question over here. Okay, so making this really brief, how do you get involved in rights of nature law? Where's a good place to study it? Um, and how do we, what's the relationship between our government? Because when indigenous people have gone and had uh, cases, they say things, a young woman was told, you're a prisoner of war, the state has, uh, the U.S. has, uh, yeah, captured your people, so to speak, years ago, so you have no rights to say this, and you're basically bringing religion into the court. So those two things. How do, you, how do we deal with the government, and how do we get involved in this in a really practical, hands-on way? The first thing I would say is you're talking about the long history of anti-Indian belief and law and practice. And, and so that is how it's been for a long, long time. But fortunately for us, uh, especially as Chippewa, there was the Malak decision that came out in 1999 from the Supreme Court, but it took 10 years for that to happen. So it was a 10 year you know, decade of things. 
And what that, what that single case says is that treaties are to be understood the way the Indians would have understood them at the time things were made, the treaties were agreed to. It's not what the words say now, what they might mean now with the modern English and things. And so simply by doing that, going back to what the parties understood at the time, changes the dynamic because there weren't dams on these rivers at that time. There weren't pipelines. There wasn't air pollution and water pollution. And so it changes the dynamic in that sense to where we have the ability to say what we would have understood because we think in those terms of the seven generations and so we know what we're supposed to remember and where we're trying to get to. So that, that's half of what you're talking about. The other part with our mainstream country, if I understand the, correction, the question correctly, is getting people to understand that their law isn't really law, it's possession and control. Laws are meant to protect people and other things, usually. And these aren't what laws are about. These are permitting laws. So they're just called laws. And they're not really laws. They're, they're, they're I don't know what you would call it, outlaws. <laughs> you know? And so we need to recognize them for what they really are. And that's the real problem, is because we think when people get together and write things on a piece of paper and make a law that it's supposed to be upheld. People don't always understand that things are actually unconstitutional or wrong, or you shouldn't be following those laws, even if people have guns and badges, you know? Because that goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, you know, the, the rights of women, the rights of slavery, those kinds of things. You have to overcome them and recognize that law isn't really law sometimes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So let's go back over this way. Hi, it's a question for any and all of you. How do you successfully defend and litigate a right to nature laws against corporate personhood and specifically uh, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment? Well, let's take a stab at that. The, what, you, what you're talking about is essentially corporate constitutional rights uh, in certain uh, extraction or other permitted activities. So when a corporation gets a permit, and let's be very practical, corporation gets a permit to frack from a state agency. That piece of paper, we don't usually think about it this way, but the corporations do, is property. That piece of paper that gives them the legal authority to do what the permit says that they can do, to frack, put a frack well in, is actually property itself. They can sell it, you can sell it, you can destroy it, it's property, that piece of paper is property. We don't think about it that way much, but that's what it is. When you pass a rights of nature law that inevitably says you can't do X because you're gonna violate the rights of the ecosystems that are dependent or protected from the activity X, the first thing you get is the corporation that's affected by the law saying you can't do that because you're taking our property illegally under the Constitution. You're acting unconstitutionally and illegally because you're overriding our corporate property rights under the law in that piece of paper, that permit. And up until now, that piece of paper has basically overridden lawmaking in the United States. Democratic lawmaking over environmental protection issues, uh, basically, have been uh, overridden by those corporate rights, which have been deemed by the courts to be embedded in the US Constitution. So corporations are persons under the law, which means they have certain constitutional rights, which means that piece of paper actually gives them certain rights that can't be taken without you paying for them. So, Inevitably, the rights of nature stuff, even though it looks simple because you're passing a law, written law, putting it on the books, and then trying to enforce it, you run up against these defenses, these legal defenses, which are premised on these corporate property rights. To get past that, you actually have to make arguments about democratic authority having the ability to pass the law and enforce it over these artificial rights that have been created for corporations. So, for example, in Florida, that's the exact argument that took place a month ago or three weeks ago in court was how these rights of nature provisions needed to override those corporate rights provisions because the municipality had the democratic authority to pass what they needed to pass. So we can talk about property stuff, which we have today, but it's very, uh, property stuff has weaseled its way into all aspects of how we govern ourselves and it's not often seen clearly, but these rights of nature cases really make it be seen clearly. That on one side are these property rights ensconced within the corporation generally, which are contesting 
our ability, our democratic ability, to actually recognize rights for ecosystems. And are we good with one person taking a question the way we have been? I love it. I'm, I'm learning even more. <laughs> All right. How about your question? Thank you. Because gene editing is so cheap and easy and now being deregulated by most Western governments, there could be tens of thousands of irreversibly released genetically engineered organisms that could replace nature in this generation so no future generation will inherit the products of the billions of years of evolution. Can you see how rights of nature can be used strategically to stop this onslaught that could replace nature? Well, yeah, it's, it's a big question in the way you're talking about. We're, we're in a neck and neck race with what you're talking about. We're trying to prevent what you're talking about happening. And, you know, we're, we're here at the end. You know, yesterday, if you were here, there was a young lady talking about the 24-hour clock and that the human, human beings got here like four seconds before midnight or whatever. And so, you know, we're, we're at the end of destroying it. The next 24 hours is going to be us destroying it and hoping that something else takes effect because that's really the next cycle that's going on. So her first answer was money. The second answer is, you know, how to broadcast this, broadcast this out so people understand it. People don't understand, you know, what it is to be without clean drinking water or bad air. Now, out here in L.A., you know what bad air is, and sometimes you know what it is in Frisco. You know, I still look back to, and I... Lake Erie when they had the algae bloom. And if you saw that on TV, you saw people black marketing cases of drinking water in 24 and 48 bottles of water for 50 bucks on the corner. I mean, that was crazy. You know, and I wasn't anywhere nearby and I didn't have any water to sell. But, you know, desperation changes everything. And that's what it's going to have to come down to, unfortunately, is that people aren't feeling it yet themselves. You know, they talk about the frog in the boiling water kind of a thing. And, and it'll stay there because it doesn't notice that it's so slow. But where we live and how, how our view of the world is, it's drastically changing for us. You know, what we know was there and what was available in nature is no longer there. We see the demise and we're very concerned. Other people, you know, like Winona says, you know, the creator didn't intend us to get all of our food from the grocery store. And if that's where you're getting all your food, you're not seeing what's going on. And so, you know, when I go out and pick wild rice, when I go out and hunt duck, when I go out and go fishing, I'm able to see what's going on in nature and have a better idea of what I'm concerned about. But how you get people to understand, most people don't have even what I would consider much engagement with nature. And so, I mean, know that people have a cat or a dog and a bird and a fish, but that's not the same thing. That's like a plantation of trees versus the forest. And so we have to engage with nature to have a relationship with nature to understand why to protect nature. And most people don't have that. And how we get to that place is going to be difficult. And I, I hate to think it's going to be a, a tough road. My, my worst fear living in North America is that everybody who lives within probably 60 miles of the coastline is going to be looking for fresh water and resources to eat in the next decade or so. And they're going to want to come to northern Minnesota. And they're going to want to come to get our fish. And they're going to want to come to get our deer and to come and get everything else. And we're going to say, hey, we talked to you about this. We have rights to nature and rights of nature. And you guys will have to negotiate. Because you can't just have everybody come in and steal and pirate. But that's what it's going to come down to. You're going to see that happen before people start thinking about the reality, I think. If I can go on just a, a, a smidge on, you know, you're talking from a marketing perspective and a market perspective, you know, your question relies on the fact that nature is going to go, you know, downwards, you know, <laughs> that there is going to be a demand, right? There's going to be a market demand for replacements for nature, and it's already starting. It's being deregulated. You know, the, it's getting full. And, and, like, right now, we already have that with food, don't we? We already have that with food. We have things that look like food, smell like food, hit our senses, have the color palette that we want. It looks and acts and smells like food, and we eat, and it's marketed, and it's food. And we already have created, marketing folks have, and corporate, corporate America has created 
the game, right? The, my kid can find 50 corporate labels and know every single one of those companies, but if I put 50 species of herbs and plants in front of them, my, that same kid cannot identify maybe 10. I mean, that would be a beautiful day if they could come up with 10 of them, but they can go down 50, probably more, maybe even to 100 logos, because it has been replicated, replaced, and, and we think that that's food, and we think, mm, we want that. Um, and so that, your, your question, really spins on the market and our capitalism, which is a very scary place to be in. And like Frank said, you know, we're gonna have a wake up call um, at some point and we hope that we're in front of it. Thank you. Well, we have time for one, maybe two questions if we keep the answers top, top of mind, AKA quick. So go for it. I'm, I'm curious what you think about the efforts behind uh, getting ecocide recognized in more legal frameworks, and where does that fit within this discussion? Thanks. Yes, I'll take that quickly. I, I think it's all part of the same thing. Um, ecocide is basically a right to life for ecosystems, and then a criminal system that can criminally enforce violations against that ecosystem. So the rights of nature laws generally recognize a right to exist for ecosystems. So it's the same thing. It's just the civil criminal side, but it's all part of the same package. I'd like to add to your response. From what I understand, um, for the tricky thing about rights of nature law is that they have to fit within the laws that each country, each sovereign nation has. But we are looking towards creating international rights of nature laws. There are bodies and organizations that are doing that. And right now it seems like they are relying on um, the human rights laws that came out of the Nuremberg trials as the foot they can stand on to support this stop ecocide movement. And it's the same thing with the international rights of nature movement. Uh, Tom, I'd like to bring you back to Moore County, New Mexico. And that was at the beginning of this. So how does it relate now? What would happen in Moore today? Yeah, I'm not sure how much of Mora is left at this point with the wildfires. That's a horrible situation that's happening out there. The Mora County uh, litigation was about uh, banning fracking, and then the county got taken to court by some of the biggest oil corporations in the, in the world, and then uh, lost, uh, lost one case, settled the other case out. Uh, and uh, the loss in the case was a federal district court judge that rendered a decision against them for a lot of the same reasons that we've talked about today, corporate rights being preeminent among them. And so I think Mora was really a learning experience about you know, how, do we, how do we take those hurdles and obstacles and rework the laws, which is what happened. Um, and I'm hoping things are not, uh, not done in Mora County, because we're more than happy to, to help again in terms of a new kind of thing. There was one county commissioner that was a real problem there, uh, Paula, uh, just to name names, uh, who stopped, uh, <laughs> stopped the process from moving forward. And so hopefully the, the political consciousness is there not to elect someone with similar tastes or philosophies. I'm afraid we don't have time for another question. Uh, we just had time for two more, and that was our second. So we're going to wrap up right now. But you can ask us later after the panel. And I apologize for that, but we are going to get a big giant cane taking us off the stage <laughs> any minute now by our production team. So we, but we do have time for a final word. And I think what I would like to add in response to what you just said, Thomas, is that we do want to create rights of nature law as a practical solution to the real life problems that we are facing. Uh, in our local communities, scaffolding out to nationally, internationally. Even a, I know a group of people, international lawyers, working on the rights of the moon, because as you know, certain people are trying to buy it up right now. And you're laughing, but it's really happening. It's like you're laughing because it's uncomfortably bad, right? And so um, another aspect of rights of nature laws is that we really need to learn about it and tell everyone we know about it and educate about it, because it is something that's nonpartisan. It is something that every human can relate to on any kind of level. And the more that we change the tide of public understanding and acceptance and just a belief that rights of nature is something that all species and humans included have a right to enjoy, the more that we're going to psychologically pressure our, our, those judges. 
And the more our elected officials are going to change, because we won't be electing people who believe in that kind of thing. So there is a very strong component of this to just learning about it and helping to spread the movement. And I'm going to take, we got about three minutes here, and I'm going to ask all of each of you to, if you want to offer any kind of final word or final thought uh, about anything at all, here's your last chance. I'll start. I was uh, just, my thought is how far Rights of Nature has come over the last uh, decade. In 2006, it was enough to get you thrown into a padded room uh, to talk about Rights of Nature. And I believe you have been in a padded room. I have <laughs> just got out. Uh, but uh, today, you've had law schools hold symposium on Rights of Nature, symposium on Rights of Nature. That wasn't the case before. You've had political parties put it into their uh, platforms. You, you have uh, these laws in Canada that have now been passed, the first in that country to protect the Magpie River, indigenous and non-indigenous communities working together. I think the, the distance that we've come in that amount of time is extraordinary. And I think it is at the precipice of really moving into an exponential growth uh, as people become more and more frustrated with the existing system that we have and as the earth continues to blow up uh, at our direction, pretty much. The rights of Monoman are gonna I think break, break the path open for a lot of tribes when the Eighth Circuit rules and we go back into tribal court against the, the state of Minnesota. What Tom started talking about, I've, I've seen myself firsthand, which is refreshing for me. The problem when you become a lawyer is you start looking at the law to figure out what to do instead of your brain and your heart. And so it gets difficult for a lot of the other people who are went to the same places we were educated. And, and so when you look at that, I've had a chance to probably talk to, I'd say, at least 20 different law schools in the United States, all the big law schools you can name, and, and some in Canada. And it's those young people who aren't lawyers yet who are looking to see a different path in a different way. And so it's going to take, you know, law schools two, three, four years long, depending upon how you go through it. And so it's going to take some of those people coming out, too, who aren't constrained by what they've been taught over all of these years and decades about how law is supposed to work. So it's, it takes a little inertia, it takes more people, but you're gonna see a lot of things happening here, I think, in the next two or three years. I'd have to agree, and I would say that, you know, we all have a role in, in this. It is not uh, an indigenous governance thing, although, you know, that's one of our strongest approaches that we we know as trained lawyers is the better approach right now and we're gonna we're taking that that advancing that so there will be a lot to come I will tell you um, in my experience there and and I've probably been barred a lot less time than these guys here um, <laughs> I still run into you know the seasoned lawyer I mean I'm, I come at a law firm of 450 attorneys and we've got some seasoned awesome attorneys at the same time you say hey what are you working on Samantha oh, I'm working on a rights of nature for tribal governance they're like what Huh? <laughs> you know? So we, we, we still, maybe not the padded cell, but that is, that is the opportunity right there. And, and talking to your neighbors, your children, um, folks that are, are anywhere in the spectrum. And I, I say anywhere because we were even talking over lunch about capitalism, right? Getting the right people into these corporations from within to shape corporate policy, to shape those actions so they do support and, and they, they pronounce their, their respect for indigenous traditional ecological knowledge and, 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 and deal with ecocide accordingly with their corporate activities. That is one very solid approach we need to explore on a very serious level, but it's also for them to explore that, we need everybody talking about it. We need you to take our picture and put it on your social media right now and say, I've learned five things about rights of nature today at this. And, Talk to me off offline and I'll tell you what I learned. You know, invite your network and your network. We have, you know, a hundred networks here that could be touched by this one conversation and keep the conversation going because the cases, the laws will change in Indian country. Um, they will be litigated in Indian country and we will have to explore that corporate approach um, and we're going to need that, that pivotal shift being pronounced everywhere all the time. Well... Big thank you to Thomas, Frank, and Samantha for being with us today. And I also want to thank, we also want to thank all of you for joining us, for caring about this movement. And just by being here today or joining us virtually, you're a part of it now. So give yourselves a big applause too. We really appreciate you. You're going to make it happen.